Okay. Good morning. Um, welcome to day two. We are going to be covering um, some of like the kind of supplemental menus today. Um, yesterday, Pat covered um, what you can find on the home screen, the core menu, and the transactions. Um, let me switch over to the wiki here. And Pat did talk about it yesterday morning, but just in case anyone's hopping in today, I just want to show this real quick as well um, to start our day off here. So the SSDT meetings and trainings, um, we do have information on this beginner training right within here. There's a whole page and you can find the agenda. The PowerPoint, we're not going to go through the power, like I'm not going to go through the PowerPoint specifically. We're going to go through um, the things that are contained in there, but that's a handy resource for you if you need to go back and review that, um, or even if you need to take some of those slides if you're turning around and teaching this um, information to your districts. Um, so that's all within there. And let's go back to our main page. So the first thing that we're going to talk about this morning is going to be the, um, the budgeting menu options. So if I come in here to the USSR documentation, all of these menus that we're going through have their own section within the manual. So if we, we could either kind of expand this, if we know which one of the um, like drop down options we're choosing, or if you click right on that menu um, item, it'll bring you to a little kind of landing page where you could either go to each of those um, options or there is like an overview of information. So the first thing that we're going to hop into when we switch over to the software is looking at the scenarios. And um, so this gives you a little um, overview of which classic programs those are similar to. So this is kind of like a bud work, uh, rev work thing. So basically your, your budgeting sheets, this is like your preliminary step, except for now you have this option within the software. This one specifically also has a little link that shows you um, that there are some steps that can be helpful um, and those are also in the wiki. So you can find those from here or if we go back, I just want to show you how to get here from the main user manual. Oh, let me just go all the way back. Um, so if we go to USSR documentation, you can also find these in the appendix. So if we open this up here, um, I'm going to go to the useful procedures and we have budgeting scenario steps um, when you are creating proposed amounts for the next fiscal year or for adjustments in the current fiscal year. And we'll talk kind of about both of those situations and what the differences would be once we start looking at the budgeting page. I am going to preface this. We did do um, usually every year we do a specific budgeting training for a Fridays with fiscal. So um, we actually did this one early this year. So there is a Fridays with fiscal that happened um, in February, I believe. Um, so that is out there. There's a recording um, that's a full hour about the budgeting uh, steps, but we're going to kind of look at it in more of a beginner view. We're going to talk more about um, what some of the different sections are. And so this will be pretty similar to that, but um, we'll kind of try and talk about it more in a basic view. So let's hop into our software and you know what? I should probably zoom this in. Okay. Um, and you know what? I forgot at the beginning, um, I know everyone's muted. Um, for now, but I we just want to mention, as always, of course, if you have questions, I do have the chat open, um, but also feel free to unmute and ask questions along the way um, if, you, if you prefer that. Prefer that. <laughs> I need more copy. <laughs> um, okay, so budgeting, scenario, scenarios. And once we're in here, we have our grid view. Um, now, when your districts first migrate, when it's our very first year of this, this because this was kind of like just the worksheet step, nothing comes over from classic. This is like a brand new thing in redesign. So year one, um, they'll come in here and this will be a blank grid. So what they'll do in that case is um, they'll want to create a new budgeting scenario. 
And there are just some basic things that they would enter in here. So let's do our budgets 2022. And actually, since I had one in the grid, I'm gonna put A. The fiscal year, so this will be used within this grid so that if they have multiple, they could have multiple scenarios for the same um, fiscal year. Um, so that would kind of help them if they needed to look up which ones were just for 2022. And then this little grid down here is where they're going to accumulate the actual information, the actual budgeting sheets that contain their accounts and then their next year budgets. The really, really important thing to remember with scenarios, especially when you're just getting started and you're just learning these, um, everything that you want to promote within a fiscal year does need to be in the same scenario. So you can have multiple scenarios for the same fiscal year, but you're basically going to push forward either one or the other. So if they, they might have a scenario like if my negotiations go this way and I need to budget this much for salaries, I have option A. If they go a different way, I have option B. And I'm not going to be combining those, pushing both of those forward. I'm going to be pushing either this one or this one. So essentially, all of their accounts would be within one scenario. You're not going to have different scenarios, like different full lines on your grid for like general account and grants. Um, all of that information is going to be within this same um, scenario. And here's how you do that. Um, so I could either create a budgeting sheet from here, or I do have the option to upload. So um, we'll look a little bit later at the report options for that, um, how they might be able to upload in a spreadsheet. Um, but there is an option where if they've created these based on like the classic bud work that they could pull that in. Um, okay. So we click create and we get this pop up. And so this is kind of similar to what we'll see more of tomorrow um, when Pat talks about reports. Um, but basically we're creating this sheet and we're saying like what columns, what information we want to be included on it. Uh, so the very first thing that you wanna look at here is the select type. So select type, I have the options for budget or anticipated revenue. So I can pull either budget accounts or revenue accounts. Um, and so this explains why I might have why I would have multiple sheets within this scenario. Uh, so let's start with budget. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we're gonna do uh, cafeteria funds, which we do that one a lot just because it's a smaller group of accounts. You know, that'll let us pull it pretty quickly for our example. Um, but really, this is just a title that I'm going to see on my grid. Over here, properties. So these are all of the options that I have available that I could add to my sheet. So if I scroll through here, you know, I, have, I could add some month to date figures. Um, I have prior year amounts. Um, and then everything that's already in my grid is already set to be included um, when I create this, this worksheet, this budgeting sheet. Excuse me. Um, so if I want to add some things to this, I can. I'm looking through here and I see I have a prior year expendable or expended. I have my fiscal year to date amounts. Um, some people also want to be able to see, let's see, we have two years prior expended, three years prior expended. And so I can just click and drag these over and now those things will be included when I create this worksheet. So um, if you have districts that really want to customize this as far as what they are seeing, um, they can certainly add more things here. As far as removing things from this grid, um, any of the totals, they, you know, they could if they really wanted to. Um, however, these different columns that have the fund, um, uh, that have like the, I'm sorry, not the fund, the account pieces, those you do wanna leave on here. This ID, I would also suggest leaving that alone as well. Um, this is something that just kind of the system uses um, to link to this account. So mostly just leave this one alone and ignore it. You don't really need to do anything with that. Um, 
but and we'll see with the other uh if you have a custom spreadsheet you don't necessarily need that on there but for these ones just leave leave that alone um so so mostly this top half i'd leave alone but if they want to take some of these off like a fiscal to date expended or encumbered any totals i say you'd be safe too um to take off if we didn't say we didn't want to see this I'm, and i'm sorry it's not a click and drag it's um just clicking this x getting a little happy with the click and drag this morning <laughs> um okay so that's this page um next is configure filters so we have this little tab up here and what the filters are going to decide so the first tab was more like what columns do we want to see um what information about each of the accounts that we're seeing do we want to include uh the filters is more which accounts how do we narrow this down um you technically don't have to configure any filters on this you could make one big worksheet with all of the account codes uh, but they probably don't want to do that and it would probably take a really long time. So I think the better way to go is if they kind of section off into groups, um, you know, they may look at those, like they may look at budgeting for their general fund different than they're going to be budgeting for their grant accounts. Um, so let's do a couple things here. Let's go ahead and just uh, filter for our active accounts because if we're kind of bringing these over to the next year to budget, we don't really need to look at accounts that we've made inactive. And then we can open this up here for the code and let's bring over the fund and say we want fund equals 006. So that'll be our cafeteria fund. And then um, we're set to go there. If they wanted to narrow this down further, like say they wanted you know, to budget for a certain OPU at a time, they could add, you know, multiple filters here if they wanted. Um, even if they have account filters, which um, I think we're going to talk about um, a bit later. Um, not sure what day. Yeah, I think that's with the utilities. So, um, oops, sorry, jumping around on you. Um, so the account filters will be a specific combination of accounts. So they could even use that um, within creating these sheets. So they have a lot of options, um, but we're going to keep it simple. We'll go ahead and save this sheet. It does tell us, you know, it's going to run in the background, especially if you have a lot of accounts that match this, you know, this could take some time, um, but I think this one should go pretty quick for us. Okay. Budget sheet creation is successful. Now, now that I'm in here, and again, I want to keep everything in the same scenario. So um, what I would do as far as like creating this entire scenario, you can do it in whatever order that you want. Um, but I would be able to create another sheet, say I create one for general fund, um, say I create one for my grants, um, or I could upload so I could do any combination of those and I could have several different rows within this budgeting sheet. Once I have this in here, I see some options. The first one is to edit. And when you click this edit, this is pretty cool. So one of the things that um, I really love that they added in here um so when you open this up what you are seeing is we're seeing all of these columns that we had just created we just added to this sheet and this works a whole lot like excel so i can kind of you know make my columns wider if i want review my information um the important column though is going to be this last column so this one it's pa and then the fiscal year PA stands for proposed amount. So when you budget, um, and if you if you ever did um, through like a probe in classic, there was certain headers that you had to use for that amount that you were um, bringing into the system. This is a similar idea to that. Um, so PA 22, so, so I made my scenario to budget for 2022. Um, I had to enter in that, um, information in the header and I said that was for sorting on the grid, but what really dictates when you push it forward what year it's linked to is this header. 
So this is really, really important, um, especially like this time it defaults to 22 because we're in 21. So it makes sense to the system that you're going to budget for the next year. Um, but in the case when you are doing current year adjustments, and there was that walkthrough in the wiki that kind of went through those steps. Um, if you're doing current year adjustments and I want to be able to apply something to 21, I have to change this and I can change it right in here and save it. Um, but you need to make sure that you remember to do that step if you're intending for it to be um, within the current fiscal year. Um, or else at the next step, you'll see that it's linked with 22 and you'll be like, oh no. Uh, the other thing that's very cool that we can do in here, so we could come in, we could type in, you know, some um, amounts manually, and then we'd be able to save this up at the end. Um, or you can do uh, formulas, just like you can do in Excel. So I can put in, so let's see, where is my prior year expended? So let's do that amount. Oh, look it already have one defaulted in here. So I'm gonna go with that. So if I do this times 1.03, so I'm increasing that by 3%. And then I could just go ahead and bring this and copy it right down, copy it all the way to the bottom. If this whole group should be, you know, the last year's expended plus 3%. And that's something that they might've been doing, whatever that formula is, they were probably doing that in their spreadsheets before. Um, so this really just gives an option where they can do it within the system instead of having to pull this down to Excel. Um, and let's go ahead and save this so we have it in here. Now, I'm going to skip this one for a second and go to these little um, up and down arrows. If they are still more comfortable pulling this into Excel, you know, maybe your treasurer has this process where you know, they're, they're bringing them from somewhere else, uh, you know, maybe they're linking that spreadsheet to something or um, say they, they just have their process down. They're just comfortable with Excel. That's what they want to do. They can just go ahead and click this down arrow. So the down arrow will download this. It opens up the same spreadsheet in Excel. I have, you know, same things I want to look out for. I have my header and I have my amounts here, and then they could go through, do exactly what they would have done on a Budwork, um, and then they save this up, and the up arrow is to upload that right back in. So um, this is where like that ID comes in handy if they're you know going, if they're downloading and bringing it back up. Um, so again, I would leave those columns alone if you're using this method. Uh, but that kind of gives an option there. Um, and then this, well, the delete would remove this from our grid. So um, say they, they don't want this one, they want to start over, they could delete this row. And then the last one is regenerate. So regenerate, um, I would advise some caution on this. You just want to make sure you know what it's doing. Uh, if I go in here and choose to regenerate this, I get back to my window. This is what I saw when I created it. Awesome. Okay, maybe I want to add another column. Like maybe there's, maybe I want to see, you know, let, let me see the um, adjustments or something, you know, so I can go add this. Um, I already have my sheet name in here. It's got my same filters. When I save this sheet, it's regenerating it. It's creating it um, back to these original specs. And what that means is it is going to get rid of any information I've updated when I edited that sheet. So if they're putting figures in there, they might not want to use this regenerate option if they've already started working. Um, so just uh, be cautious with that because now I can see, you know, these figures that I put in um, for my amounts, those are no longer there. So let's go put these back. So it can definitely be handy, you know, if that's something that uh, they're trying to like renew their spreadsheet, they're trying to get it back to um, their original amount so they can kind of start over. That might be something that they're intending to do and that's totally fine, that's what it's there for. Um, but just want to be careful of if they think they're just adding a column and they're gonna keep all of their numbers, that may not be the case. That's not gonna be the case. 
Um, so let's go ahead, let's save this. And then this upload option is very straightforward, very simple. Basically, I would give this um, a sheet name, which is what I'm going to see in this grid. I could give it a description. And then I would just choose a file from my computer and start the upload. Um, what my spreadsheet needs to have in this case is it needs to have um, all of those account code columns broken out. So the fund, function, special cost center, just how we saw. Um, and it needs to have a PA column, the column with the PA header, PA dash the, full, the four digit fiscal year. And let's go here. I'm gonna open another tab. Um, I'm going to, let's see. Let's look at the reports from here. Uh, I just want to point these out. Um, again, Pat is going to go into the like the actual reports um, module or page and the reports manager tomorrow. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea, this budget expense worksheet is available in here. Uh, we have a couple um, a couple definitions that are also in the walkthroughs too. Uh, that are formatted very similar to the classic report. Um, and if we pull this, I should have filtered it. Um, let's see if we have See, we have these spreadsheets here. I forget if we have a screenshot of those. No. Oops. So I just pulled that report for all of my accounts, you know, whether they're um, active or not. So that's why that one's going to take a minute. Um, I'm just checking to see if maybe I have one uh, in my downloads real quick so we can, so we don't have to wait. Oh, here we go. Okay. So this is basically what it looks like. We have um, our different codes in here. And then, okay, so yeah, I'm sorry. This one doesn't have the PA header. This one does have um, the prior year information though. So the one that's in the system, this worksheet um, is a bit more um, informational. But if you were to pull the bud work from classic, you could add a column um, so if the, if the district's in the midst of migrating, they could add the PA column. And then, let's add this one. So if you wanted to um, get this report and use it with your district, you're gonna do these same steps. So I just clicked right on the header and I just downloaded it. And then come in here. Okay. Okay, I know I'm going a little off the rails, but I want to show you this one. Filter this time. Okay. So now this one looks a whole lot like what we were just seeing with our other report. Um, you'll notice it doesn't have the ID this time. So if you are just uploading from scratch, you don't have to worry about trying to pull that um, funky ID column, but it does have all of our account pieces. So I just wanna open this one up more. And we have our PA column and um, that we'd have to put in the fiscal year manually here. Um, but it does have our informational columns with our totals built in. Really, other than like how you're putting it back in the system, 
there isn't much difference with using this versus creating the sheets. Uh, so let's get back, let's get back here. So if I'm creating that spreadsheet, I would just go in here once I get all the amounts entered in and I could choose the file, start the upload. And then once I get it in here, it's going to be aligned just like the ones that I've created in here. Um, so we looked at, you know, okay, if we create it from here or if we upload it from that spreadsheet, um, there's not, other than like how you're doing it, there's not necessarily a difference. It's basically, these are different options. Um, so when you start working with your districts on this, you could do it the first way or you could do it the second way, whichever one that you or they are more comfortable with. Um, so once you're in here, so I would um, get, you know, all of the budgeting sheets or even, you know, maybe I just start with one and I want to come back and work on it. I don't have to do them all at once. I'm going to save this up. I could always come in here and edit and add more sheets if I'm just kind of want to work as I go. The other option that you'll notice up here is clone. So the first year, this grid is going to be blank. The first year that they come in to redesign, this grid is going to be blank and they'll be creating. Um, however, in future years, if they want to start, say, you know, say they have all of their different sheets on here, they put a lot of work into organizing that. The following year, they could come in, they would just click to clone this, and then they could update, you know, the title. So they're going to be budget 2023. Um, you know, they could enter this in, save it up. And then they would be able to go in, use those edit options, use the download options and upload. Um, and then they could just modify for the new year instead. So that's kind of exciting. Now, once we have our amounts in here, the next step, um, so view, edit, these are things that we were just looking at within our pop-up um, or they could delete one of these is this upload arrow. And this upload arrow is what's gonna get us to the next page. So we're gonna promote this scenario. And what this warning is telling us, the promotion is gonna replace existing proposed amounts for fiscal years um, related to this scenario. Are you sure that you wanna promote? This is the reason I said everything has to be in one scenario. Um, because if they had like a scenario for, you know, that just had their general or just had their grants, when they go to do the next one, it's gonna overwrite it. So we're, you know, at this stage, we're like, okay, we're good. We have everything in the same scenario that I want to push forward for this fiscal year, and I can go ahead and promote that. Um, so that's successful. That looks excellent. And this is where we go switch to our next page. So the proposed amounts grid is where we just move that to. And we can see, so I did my cafeteria, um, my cafeteria fund. So I have all of my different accounts in here and um, I can see these amounts that I had entered in. And then once I'm on this grid, I do still have the ability and the flexibility to go ahead and come in here and say something changed and I need to update this. I could go ahead and update this. I haven't fully applied these yet. Um, I'm still kind of in a working area. Um, when you are at this point, um, you will see these on the account in the next year proposed amounts, uh, but it doesn't fully apply them until you click this apply button. Um, is there a way to change the description? I'm not sure. Oh, the description. When we were in the previous page, there was a description for the budgeting scenarios that you could change or the budgeting sheets. So that um, definitely can happen. The description we're looking at on this page is related to the account. So um, when you're creating accounts, which Pat showed yesterday, um, there is an option to put your own description in. And what we're seeing here is like, if somebody just didn't put in a description when they created the account, it defaults to uh, what's basically in the USAS manual. So um, all of those descriptions could be, um, could be customized if you need to, yes. Um, okay, 
So, so what they might want to do is create their scenario when they have the scenario that they're planning on applying, they can push it over to the proposed budgets. If there's still a chance for things to maybe change, you know, maybe they leave it in this proposed amounts grid for a bit. Uh, it will show as their next year proposed so they can pull it on reports. Um, and then if they need to tweak these numbers still, if they need to come in, you know, maybe make a couple little changes before they're actually um, to the new fiscal year. And, and I'm talking about this from the perspective of like this time of year. Like if we are in the spring and they're not, you know, and they're getting ready, getting these ready for the new fiscal year, but we're not actually in it, um, this can kind of be a preliminary stage. Once they do apply them, if they were to apply them to the next fiscal year this early, um, I would also recommend that they would leave these in this grid, um, you know, so that they can show as the next year proposed. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, once you get to the new fiscal year, you can go through and delete these out of here. Uh, you don't have to, but if, you know, if the if your your district likes to, you know, keep this kind of cleaned up, you would be able to select all and delete. Um, but let's talk about applying these. So um, if I come in here, so say I'm ready, set to go um, apply these for my new fiscal year. What I would do, and you could potentially have multiple fiscal years in here. So what I would do, make sure my fiscal year is selected and I would click to apply. Now, once I'm ready to apply, I get this pop-up. Um, my pop-up has these different options for transaction type. So I mentioned that you could do adjustments. So um, if I was doing adjustments for the current fiscal year, I could choose this option. And with this option, I could, you know, choose whether or not I want it to update the gap budget. Um, and then I would be able to put in an effective date. So when I want those adjustments to be dated in the system. And you know, um, since we're talking about adjustments, the other big thing that I want to mention, if, if you are doing adjustments, I would 100% um, recommend, especially, you know, the first time through, use that walkthrough. Uh, the adjustments through this grid are different uh, when you're entering the amounts. So when you're entering the amounts in that PA 2021 field, the amounts that you want to enter will not be just like, I want it to be adjusted by this much you want to put in what you want your new expendable to be. So that is different than um, maybe what you were used to in classic. Um, but that is, there's a big note about that in the walkthrough. So keep that in mind um, when you are doing adjustments. And I know I'm going to be throwing a lot of information at you today. So that's why some of these things I'm like, you know, there's a note. I'm just gonna give a big warning for this because then when you get in the thick of it and you're doing it, hopefully that just stands out as like, hey, there's a red flag on this one, I gotta check. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go back though because we're doing our um, budgets for next year. So I have options for temporary or permanent. Uh, temporary, when I select this, you know, I could choose whether and uh, whether or not I want it to be the gap, um, if I wanted to update the gap amounts, it is going to be the effective date for 7-1 and then whether or not I want it to be like marked as a full year uh, budget. When I do permanent, these things are decided for me. So really, here's the difference. When you choose to put this in as a temporary budget, there are um, basically just there's a little like identifier that happens in the background that says this is temporary. Um, then that can be used with reports um, mostly. So they could see on a report, you know, okay, that one was temporary. Same thing with the full year checkbox. That's really kind of like informational. Like if you can pull it on a report, oh, this was marked as it was intended to be for the full year or not. Um, these don't necessarily have uh, the full year specifically doesn't necessarily have like a big impact on, you know, what's actually like happening with that budget in the system, but it does help you keep track of information. Uh, the, the effective date is very important and that's why it's um, defaulted in both of these options. Um, 
but the other thing to keep in mind with temporary, so I can apply a temporary budget. Then something changes. So um, then maybe I have another temporary budget, so I could apply another temporary budget and that would replace the first one. And then when I have um, my permanent budget, I apply that, that replaces my temporary. So I have that sequence of events. You know, I could go back and kind of like see, uh, there, there is a report in the um, public reports, the shared reports library, where that's really helpful for seeing um, if you ever need to see this progression. Um, once I apply my permanent budget, if I apply a temporary, it's not gonna replace the permanent. So really um, the important thing to keep in mind with temporaries versus permanents is your timing. Temporaries would always come first. Once a permanent's applied, um, you'd have to do another permanent to replace it. So um, that's pretty much uh, the thing to keep in mind when you're choosing between those. Mostly, uh, you know, some districts just like to like have like they have their temporary budget that's at the beginning of the year before it's fully approved. So that's just kind of a way to mark um, that that was the case. So then I would just go ahead, apply this. Um, it is gonna go in and add these amounts to each of the accounts in my grid. So sometimes that can take a while. Um, I don't think that there's really too much benefit to us um, actually applying this since we're in the current fiscal year still. Um, so I'm just gonna X out of this instead, but normally you would hit apply. <laughs> uh, let's go look up though. I did tell you that this was gonna show our next year proposed on our account. So let's go to our account page and look one of these up just so we can see what I'm talking about. One for one, one on one. Okay. So I'm just gonna use this little view icon. So this was the first, um, the first one on our grid. All of these numbers that we're looking at here, um, we're gonna reference, okay, so we're in February, 2021. So everything we're seeing up in our um, fiscal year information and month relates to that. But we have this nice little field at the bottom here that says next year proposed. There is our 40,000 that we just entered in there. And now that can be pulled on reports and such um, since we um, put that in our proposed month's grid. Uh, the the other tab here is for anticipated revenues. So um, I showed when we were making our budgeting sheets kind of back at the beginning that uh, you could make you you would make your revenues and those would be separate worksheets. So if you made those, those would go on this different grid as well. Uh, kind of the same way where you'd have a bud work or a rev work. Um, so it just kind of like kept separate, but everything works exactly the same. Uh, once you have items in here, it would have the fiscal year, you would have apply, you could do all the same stuff. So the other thing to note is you do have um, the same options as, you know, your other grids throughout the software. So your advanced query, if you wanted to look up a specific, uh, say you have, you know, all of their accounts in this grid and this is really big, you want to do a specific search. You could pull this proposed uh, budgets grid right to a report. Um, you know, say they want to look at totals and just double check some things. Um, and then you have more and reset options. Um, those are pretty standard. Okay. So I think uh, that's about uh, where we're going to leave it for budgets. Uh, next, we're going to get into the periodic menu. I think I'm going to take a look at a couple of things. We'll shoot for a break around 1015. Um, but does anybody have questions about um, any of these budgeting items before we move on? Okay, hearing none. Okay, well, if you if you think of anything, I still have the chat open, so let me know. Um, next, we're going to the periodic menu. And these things are, um, it's a combination of kind of like reports and um, places where you'd input information. Uh, but what they have in common is that 
they're all for things that happen at specific times or are needed at specific times throughout the year. Um, so I mean, that 1099 extract stands out. So obviously that's something you're going to be looking for around calendar year. Um, some of these are related to fiscal year processing. Um, and then we have some reports. So I'm going to start with just kind of talking about the reports that are available in here. And let's go to this appropriation resolution report. Um, and actually, a couple things I want to, I told myself I'd be good about showing you where these are in the wiki, because I really think, um, especially when you are learning, coming in and having this wiki and having it kind of organized exactly like this menu, you know, can be very helpful. So um, we come in here, we have our periodic menu, and the first place we're going to go is to its appropriation resolution. Um, and some of these pages have more involved than others, but uh, put a star next to the appropriation resolution because this one has some important information on it. Um, so when we are looking at running this report, when we come in this page, this page looks very, very simple. Um, but there are a couple more things to this. So the basics, we have, we can choose the fiscal year that's gonna show on the header of the report. Amounts to use. So this dictates that we can run this report multiple different ways. We could have it where we see beginning balances only. We can have it where we see next year proposed. Now, next year proposed is based on so if i want the next year proposed which means i want the figures that i just put in for 2022 i need my fiscal year to still be 2021 because in 2021 they are for next year and that gets a little bit confusing um but i believe that there is a note here there's a note right in here in the documentation so if that ever trips you up um there's a little example in here for that um, and then we could have the appropriate amounts carryover in totals or appropriation the fiscal today appropriation minus um, carryover encumbrances. So we have all these different ways to run it. Um, also, this report is similar to the classic, um, I believe it's APRES for like for appropriation resolution. So APPRES. Um, so these options are directly related to those options that they had with the classic report. By default, um, it does not include accounts that have zero balances, but if you did want to include those, you could. And then we're gonna leave it as PDF and we're going to generate this. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I was just checking my volume. I wasn't sure if somebody was just trying to speak, but if you were and I didn't hear you, please send a chat. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's our report once we run this. And um, I chose it for the beginning balance type. Um, so that's going to dictate the columns that I see on this report. And um, I have, so here's the fiscal year I chose. Here are the options I chose. And then um, I'm going to see, so I have this broken down at my general fund, my fund special cost center, I have it down by functions and um, by object code groups. Now, one thing you might be asking, or you might be asked by your districts is maybe I don't want it broken down, you know, by, you know, each of these different detail levels. Uh, when we ran this report, it was very simple. We didn't see, you know, a specific way to um, limit that, but there is, um, there is a way to set this up in the system. Um, so what I would do is I would come over to, you know what, let's go. I'm just switching to my second tab so I can leave my report open. So if we go to core accounts, 
And my first tab here is the fund accounts. Um, so if I open this up, go to edit my account. I have some fields on here that are going to help us update this report um, if we want to. So um, what they could do is they could come in here, they would set this ahead of time. And then when they go to run this, it'll you know keep these uh, options in here and then use those for the report. So included in the resolution. So yes, this is what's gonna dictate that it shows on that report. And then the resolution levels are what's dictating uh, these different levels. So we have um, fund special cost center, function one digit, function two digit, and then the object one digit. So each of these are checked. So that is why the report is showing me each of those different levels. If I wanted to update this, I could easily just say, you know, hey, want this to be a little bit less specific save that up and then I could go run the report again and that would be updated. There is another one that you'll notice in here, certificate reporting is what we're gonna talk about next. Uh, we're gonna look at the certificate reports and that has an option within here if you wanted that to be by fund or fund special cost center. So um, we might as well just note that while we're in here so we don't have to hop back and forth again. <laughs> Okay, so here's our instance. Um, and uh, back to our documentation. Um, so within here, this is noted, um, you know, as far as those reporting levels. So if you need to uh, refer to that. The other thing that's in here though, is the narrative, uh, narrative data for the resolution. Um, so this is something, there is a sample within here in, um, a Word document that they can use. So if you have a district that's looking for looking for that, uh, they would go to the wiki page or you go to the wiki page to be able to get this and they could use um, this narrative that they may, may need to send with the report. Okay, all right, so Let's go to our next one. Um, so I'm going to hop down now to the certification reports. And this is like um, classics. I believe it was um, AMD cert and cert bow. Um, so those options are both contained now within the certification reports option. And we have amended certificate of estimated resources. You have a summary or a detail version. Um, and then the certificate of available balances summary or detail version here. Depending on which one you choose, you can see we have a little bit of a switch up in our options. So depending on which options are relevant um, is what you're going to see, you know, once you make your selection on the report. Uh, we have tax options. Um, if you wanted to exclude certain uh, fund or special cost centers, um, be able to enter that in here uh, to, you know, exclude certain ones from the report. And if you needed to do this, um, any of these boxes, you just click this plus. Enter in your account. And then if you need to add another, you could just continue. So that's how um, those work. The principal amounts for permanent funds. Okay, I have some notes on um, some of these boxes here. So I wanna make sure I cover these appropriately. Let's see. Um, okay, so for this one, uh, the same thing you're gonna enter it, um, just how we looked at, um, and this would be for um, associated uh, with the associated principal amount for any permanent funds. So the reporting requirements say that only interest earnings are supposed to be considered available for the expenditure um, when certifying year and balances of a permanent fund to the county auditor. Um, so the amount that you enter here is gonna be subtracted from the beginning balance. The other, um, the next part here is advances not repaid. And, and again, I believe these options are the same that was uh, 
with the uh, classic report. So if this is something that your district's been running regularly, they probably, you know, kind of have this down, um, but kind of just an overview um, for these things. So the advances not repaid is um, they would enter any advances that have not been repaid as of July 1st. And when they enter this one, um, they would enter a positive amount and a negative amount. So they would be entering these, see we have an amount field here. And so it would be um, an advance, you know, to this account from this account. And so they would enter both of those lines in there. Um, let's see, okay. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're doing the amended certificate summary report first. Uh, let me close this out here. And I'm just gonna leave, I'm just gonna run this kind of wide open. Um, I don't think that this one will take too long. We'll see. Um, but what I want to do is talk about some of the totals that we're gonna see on this report. Oops. Sorry, my chair is being weird. Okay. All right, so we have our cover page. So we, we see our options here. We have, um, you know, the way that we ran the report. And I ran this a summary version. So if you run the detail, you would have all the different, you know, lines for each of these different um, categories. But just to have it be pretty easy to look at, I ran the summary. So we're only seeing the totals. Um, so we have the um, unencumbered balance for July. Uh, for July 1. Um, this is going to be calculated uh, for each fund by taking the July 1 cash balance minus the prior year encumbered plus advances not repaid minus the principal entered. So those options that we were looking for when we, you know, they could enter those in when they were running the report, if they did enter information in there, that will have a direct impact on this first column. Uh, the taxes and the other sources. So these are related to receivable amounts. These are the final receivables at the time, which would include any additions or deductions made. Um, and then if they didn't, if they don't enter receivable amounts, so if they didn't enter those like anticipated revenues, like how we were just looking at with the budgeting module, then these would be blank. Um, or there'll be zero rather than blank. And then um, to the total is the total of column one, two, and three together. Um, so that's how each of those are calculated. And let's see, let me go. I'm just gonna go back here. We do have um, these sections in here. So now we're looking at the certification reports. Um, this explains each of those um, amounts, or I'm sorry, each of those options uh, for the report. And here are the calculations that I just went through. So if you need to um, look up that information, if you have a question about it, those are available in the wiki. Uh, one thing that I would note as being pretty important here is this middle column that is receivable amounts. You'll see the, <laughs> this is serious. We have a, italics and an underline, but you know where that gets confusing is some people might think that it is the received amounts like what was actually received. And that's not the case. This is um, the anticipated amount. So um, what was estimated as opposed to the actual. Um, just a note here, so this does uh, include information, uh, the first calculation does include uh, the carryover encumbrances. So the first year when you have a district migrate, if they did have a difference in carryover encumbrances, um, that is going to impact uh, the total on this report. So um, when balancing, they would have to uh, keep that in mind um, for this report. And let's go ahead and look at one of these cert bow, um, <laughs> certificate of available balances. And we'll go with the summary again. Um, so for this one, uh, they have uh, similar options here. So you could go ahead and enter anything in um, if needed. 
And then Okay. So with this one, we have um, a couple more broken out columns. Cash balance for June 30th. So this is going to be um, June 30th of the prior year. So this is where they started, um, you know, before the fiscal year that I'm reporting on. Uh, encumbrances for June 30th, same thing. Advances not repaid, that is going to, um, be you know what I entered when I was running the report. The carryover balance available for appropriation. Um, so this one is a calculation. This is column one minus column two and then plus or minus column three. So this is a calculation of these three, these first three columns. Um, let's see. And then total amount from all sources available for expenditures. Uh, so this is going to be, let's see, um, this one again, pulled from the receivable amounts that are stored on revenue accounts. Um, so um, the example I just have in my notes is that, so for the general fund, this would be the total amount um, receivable for all um, for all the general fund accounts. So again, not the actual, the estimated. And then the total amount available plus balances. So that is um, again going to be a calculation of uh, this column and this column. So columns four and five is going to give us our grand total. Any questions on either of those two report categories? Okay. I know those ones are very exciting <laughs> with all the calculations, um, but I know we do get a good amount of questions on those, you know, when the districts have to, because um, they're having to submit those and stuff, so. Um, and sometimes, like, I think this, you know, some of these reports where, especially since it has the um, receivable amounts on it, um, like, I've talked um, to ITCs or districts, you know, in the situation where they maybe didn't even use this through the uh, system before, because uh, it was in classic, but um, not all districts would, you know, allocate their receivables uh, within the system, so they wouldn't even, even use this, but now this is in here, and if they're looking for a time to make a change, you know, especially migrating over to redesign, you know, this could be something that they might start using. Um, all right, so let's hit a couple more and then we'll take a break. Uh, cash reconciliation. So this one, very, very nice. Again, another one that they may have not even been using in classic, uh, but now that we're in redesign, it's pretty user friendly. Um, it's really convenient because you can, can kind of copy it um, from month to month. Um, but really, so they don't have to use this monthly, but uh, they do need to use it at the end of the fiscal year because it gets um, reported with their financials. So they could uh, come in here and create, um, and then they'd have, you know, a brand new blank slate. They would pick which posting period that they want to associate this with. And this does correspond to the posting periods that are available that have been created in that core posting period page that we looked at yesterday. Um, so I'm not gonna save this one, so I'm gonna leave it as February. Uh, if I was coming in here for the first time, so then how this works is they would come in here, they could put a description and they could put you know, their bank, they would put how much um, they had to that. And then you click add, and then you just go do another one.
and they could just come in here, you know, and add these. And um, so in classic, it was kind of like a worksheet program similar um, to this, but you had to like go in and then go out. Like it wasn't very convenient to enter it. So if they were doing that, I think your districts are going to be very, very happy with, um, with this. So, um, so they'd come in here, they'd enter all of this information, adjustments, other, in, um, other investments. These are all like standard sections to uh, basically this kind of laid out um, to be consistent with the EMIS manual because this gets reported as part of the financials. So, you know, having these like limit four, limit five. So that's all consistent um, with that layout. Once you get to the bottom here, there is, so all of these different fields are all going to be based on whatever they put in. These are all calculated. So as I started entering amounts, it was entering a total here. Um, but so again, sorry for my scroll. So the one column, total fund balance, this is actually coming from their books, this figure right here. So they could run, um, like you could run a cash summary and see that total fund balance on there. And this would balance to that for the month of February. So that's really nice because once they enter everything, that's a little double check. They want to make sure that what they've entered would match their actual fund balance. And that can kind of help them balance for the month too. So let me get out of here. Um, I'm going to open up Here's one that I already entered for February. So I put a couple more things in here and uh, made sure that this balanced. So we can see they would have the total entered, total fund balance. Great, great, great. And um, so then they, they would save it. I just canceled it since I didn't make any changes. Um, and then they have the options up here. So when I'm ready to do March now, I could just go ahead, clone this. And then all I do is switch my month and I could come in here and I could go ahead and just start changing my amounts. I could just go through, I could tab through. Um, so I'm just using tab on my keyboard, um, update their amounts. And then um, this part down here, the total fund balance, I didn't change my posting period. So it looks the same, but when I do this, I would change my posting period. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm sorry. I, cha I, I changed it on the sheet. So I did, I changed my posting period that I'm creating this for here. So um, it does actually, it does pull the fun balance from that. Apologies, <laughs> um, but that's even better. Uh, so the total fun balance here, um, and then I would be able to go match that up. And um, then I would save and I have my here, let's just go ahead, we'll save this one. It's gonna give me a warning um, because so I didn't actually update my figures to make it balance. So it's saying, you know, my total um, cash reconciliation amount doesn't balance to what my uh, total fund balance is, which it still lets you save. This is a warning. So maybe this is something that they're kind of like entering as they go and they'll go back to it. Um, but at least that lets them know that they'll need to, you know, there's something off in here that they need to find an update. And then once they're all done, um, what they can do is print this to file. And when they click that, it's going to create a PDF. It gives them all of those figures that they entered in. It gives them the descriptions that they entered in. Um, here's their total column. It shows um, their total fund balance on here. And so normally they would be balanced. And um, then it has a signature line as well. So if this is something that the treasurer signs off on monthly, you know, prints out, keeps in there, um, you know, keeps with their documentation, then um, that is available right from that screen. So that's really handy, um, you know, I think in here and just really, once they get the first one in there, really easy to create with the clone option. Okay. All right. So uh, next we are going to go to our five-year forecast. This is another one. I, I really like, um, you know, kind of how it is in here, especially with the output uh, report that you can generate. All right. 
So once we come into this page, we can see we have a lot of information right off the bat. Um, we have our line numbers, this description, um, and then, so this is the description of the line number, or we have the forecast line number with all the information. We can see the account um, that this is pulling for, and then we have um, some of our figures with, you know, prior years, current year, um, etc. So um, if we wanted to come in here, so I'm um, sorry, so I just clicked on the header, so it's going to go ahead and um, actually sort this. So let's sort it back by line number. Um, so, you know, if you needed to look through these items, um, just kind of have a visual, you can. Uh, where this is coming from, so if I'm looking at the account and the line number, when the accounts are created, like on that account screen, there is a spot where it gets populated on the account itself with the forecast line number. So that's how it's deciding that those, um, that these accounts are associated with this line number. I could generate this right to CSV for, from here if I just wanted like the data file um, and I'm going to put that into like maybe a third party if they're using something else um, to work with their five year forecast. Um, or if I click Excel and I go to generate this file, um, it's going to take a bit, but what this is going to put the format into is um, it's the SSDT forecast spreadsheet. So this has been available on our website um, for quite some time. So people used to go grab that, uh, take the information from classic, paste it in one of the tabs, and then it would create uh, the actual like forecast sheet. Um, so we'll look at this, but I'll tell you, I know that this is gonna take a bit because it is pulling in a lot of information. So um, I think our move here is to let this run. Let's take, um, Let's take about a 10 minute break. So it's 10 08 um, by my time. So uh, let's come back at 10 18. Our report should definitely be done by then. And then we'll take a look at that and continue on. So if anybody needs, um, you know, oh, look, and it's going to show already. We're still taking a break. Um, anybody needs to get more coffee, um, take a stretch, and um, I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. All right, so we are back. Um, we'll continue on here. Uh, take a look at this five-year forecast. And let's see, all right. So when we open this up, um, once it generates, we're gonna open this up. And again, this is the Excel version that we're looking at. Um, we come in here, you wanna make sure you click enable editing. Um, I've noticed that sometimes if you start just jumping into the tabs before you uh, enable it, um, and enable the content, then it doesn't always look exactly right. Um, but once you get in here, so we have our fiscal year, we ran this for 2021. If I come into the data tab, so this was the data that it pulled in. Um, and then if I come to my forecast line, um, I wanna scroll up to um, these line items that I have but you can see that this pulled in the data from the system and then um, through that data tab and through how this spreadsheet is set up, it's just gonna start putting the figures right in here um, for you. So that's really convenient. There are a bunch of other tabs in here as well. Uh, we have uh, some summary view. There are some different uh, views and charts. But again, this is the SSDT template that was available um, through our website before. Um, it was just an extra step to have to like kind of paste that data in there. And let's minimize that. Okay. Um, so that's the five-year forecast, just as far as like pulling that from the system, pretty straightforward um, for this option. Next, we're gonna to go to the spending plan page. So what this is, um, the spending plan grid that we're seeing is where they're gonna be able to put in their estimates. So uh, the estimates do not get pulled over from Classic. Uh, this is the SM12 program. Um, what they would do instead is they would come in here, choose the fiscal year, 
they would be able to pick a line number and then come in here and enter in um, what their estimates were or are um, or are going to be in future years. Um, and they would just be able to go in here, enter um, each of the months and then save those. Um, you'll notice there was here, let me do another one. There is a create new option. So if they wanna come in and um, go ahead and put some figures in here and then save, if they have that checked, it's just gonna open the very next one. So they could just kind of go through and do these all um, to enter those in all at once. Now, what these are then gonna be used for is the spending plan reports that are available in redesign. So let's go. Um, I just wanna show um, a couple quick things with these reports. If I come from the homepage and um, I have three reports related to the spending plan. So I have the spending plan comparison, monthly and summary. Uh, so let's see. So the spending plan summary is comparable to the classic um, SM2M. When you run this, you do have to come over to these query options and these fields are required in order to run this report. So the fiscal year, I'm gonna put in 2021. When I'm putting in the beginning and ending month, I do want to enter these in as like a numerical value. So I could enter this as um, 07 to 07. So that's going to be um, one month. And then I'll go ahead and generate this. Um, let's see. And I want to show you uh, the columns on here. So technically, you could run this if you wanted to do it for a range. Like I just did, you know, seven to seven, that's one month. Um, but I think it I think it works better if you do it for one month at a time, honestly. Uh, if you were to do mon multiple months, like you can, but that's going to dictate what you're seeing in these monthly columns. So if you're doing two months, it's kind of, I don't know, you have to remember that it's going to be adding those multiple months in your monthly column, which... Um, which you know does make sense if it's those are the monthly figures, but I know that can be confusing. So, um, so anyways, so the month that we set is going to dictate what figures I'm seeing in these monthly columns, and then the fiscal to date is dictated by you know what fiscal year I ran it for, um, and you can see here that the estimates that I entered in um, when I just did that quick. Um, quickly entered a couple of those in there for these line items are showing in the estimate columns. So that's why you would go to that periodic menu and add those so that when you run this report, you know, you'd have um, all of these figures in here and then it would calculate the difference between your estimate and your actual. Uh, the next one, so the spending plan monthly is the, um, it's the SM2 um, MON. And uh, we come in here, we put in our fiscal year. Let's run this one real quick. Um, and I believe this one is just actuals. Um, but because it's going to show our monthly figures for each of the line items. Give that one a minute. Let me close down some of these other things I have going on. Okay. So, yeah, so this one is all actual figures. So this isn't impacted by, you know, the figures that we specifically entered in um, our peri periodic menu, but this can still be helpful. So um, here's your actual uh, fiscal year to date, and then it's broken down by month on this report. Um, so you'd have your actual, you know, total revenue for November. Boom. There you go.
And then the last one here is the spending plan comparison. This one, again, this also does um, take into account the actuals and the estimates. So um, this is the other one that's impacted by what you've entered on periodic. And these ones can take a minute, but um, again, you just got to keep in mind that it's pulling, you know, all of those figures. So it's calculating the totals from each of those accounts, you know, by looking at, you know, which line, which line item they're associated with, um, and then pulling it together with those um, estimated figures. And I know it's comparing them, so this one may have a difference on it as well. So let's see, okay, so we have our fiscal, yeah, so here's the thing. So we're getting a whole lot of information on this report. It's kind of like a combination between the previous two that we looked at. So for forecast line item one, here are the estimated figures. This is what we were entering from the periodic menu. I put in this 899. Um, so that's for July, for August. So here's just those numbers that I had started typing in. And if I had gone all the way down, it would you know, show all the way across. And then this is from the system. So here's the actual amount that's associated with that, with the accounts that are associated with that line item. And then this report is going in and doing the math to calculate the difference between what I had entered as an estimate and what was actually, um, was actually, so I guess these are revenue accounts, was actually received on those accounts um, and what the difference was on that. And it's doing that for each line for each month. So um, definitely a lot of information for them here. This one is uh, the SM2 CMP was the classic report for this. Okay. So let's see, I don't know if we'll necessarily be running any more like reports from this one. The options that we have left on here are really things that are associated with, um, with like end of year items. So first let's do the fiscal year end items. So some of these things, um, you know, you'd, I believe they're on the checklist. Uh, I know at least some of them are, if not all of them. Um, actually, I think all of them are on the fiscal year end uh, checklist. Um, so these things you would review at that point in time. Some of these even, uh, like the building profiles that we're gonna go into first, we suggest going and uh, taking a look at this after you migrate a district. Uh, this does not come over from classic. But again, uh, once you get these in here, then they are things that can be used year to year. Uh, there are options to clone things and stuff like that. So uh, your building profiles page, basically uh, what you would do, come in here, um, you would enter your IRN. A description. And so these, so this is for each building within the district is what they're going to be entering these for. Uh, the square footage, and then transportation percentage and lunchroom percentage. So this is something, they had a page for this in Classic, uh, basically, and why this is associated with year end is that this gets reported with the financials. So this um, helps kind of figure out like, you know, what's the allocation um, of the district of like which buildings have more transportation, which has more lunchroom and that helps uh, with, you know, evaluating what they're spending on those for those buildings. Um, let's just make this easy and do, um, let's make this bigger. So we have some different percentages in here. Um, so what we're going to do is we would add our different buildings.
And really, um, so I would usually have more than two buildings, <laughs> but for the sake of looking at this, um, you know, just for our example, um, they would have each of these lines. And then what would be important here is that these percentages would equal 100 between all of the different lines that are available or that are entered in here. So, um, you know, if they had four or five buildings, like whatever their percentage is, the total percentage should equal to 100. Uh, same thing for the lunchroom percentage. Uh, let's see. So next we have, let's do the civil proceedings. Um, again, this is something that was just entered at fiscal year end um, to be included with the financial reporting and um, they would just come in here. They can uh, enter in, they can use create, enter in a row. This has, you know, any of the information that they may need to um, enter in. So they would do the fiscal year proceeding number and the district usually has, you know, all of this information that they know that they need to enter when it comes to fiscal year end. So next we're gonna talk about these federal assistance pages, same thing, entered at fiscal year end. Usually um, they know, you know what information needs to go into these. Um, it's just a matter of how they enter it. Um, one thing that you need to remember, and this is definitely noted in our checklist is the federal assistance summary does need to be done before the detail. So uh, I know that's a little bit weird because you know detail alphabetically is first, but the summary is what's going to set up the fiscal year. So I can see here I have fiscal year 2020, fiscal year 2021, um, but this does need to exist so that when I go to enter the detail, I have the fiscal year to attach it to. Um, so if I just open this up, you can see this is really, really simple. It's basically just the fiscal year um that you're creating it for some of this information even defaults and then if they needed to add a comment they could and when we come into detail this is where you can see that when i create one of these records um it's going to ask me for the federal assistance summary and that's why i had to create it first <laughs> so uh so i come in here and then here are the two records that um, I had available uh, because those are what's showing on my summary grid. So we pick one here. And then what I would do is associate a line number with it. So I have two existing line numbers. So this is giving me line number three. Um, the CFDA number. So this is something that is um, standard. It's basically associated with the grant. So you have the CFDA and the grant title. Um, if I hover over this, there is a website where your districts would be able to look this up. Um, so that's, you know, outside of redesign, that's something that's kind of just um, dictated. Um, that's, it's kind of like a standard thing. So what we did was we put this uh, website address in here so that if they want to go be able to look this up, they could open another tab, type that in, and then go search for the CFDA number and grant title that they would need to use. Uh, once they enter that in too, they can also select a cash account that they would associate it with. So it's probably going to be, you know, uh, one of these grant accounts. Uh, let's see, let's just pick like a title one. And then um, they would be able to uh, type these in or let's go double check the documentation because now I'm questioning this. We've made, um, we made quite a few updates to this page recently. So some of these things like, um, like the tool tips, those are um, newer. So let's see, sorry, my, little video window is getting in my way. Okay, so let's go to our documentation. Let 
Let's add. Hmm. Okay, well, it seems like our wiki doesn't want to load for the moment, so we're just going to leave that alone. Um, where am I here? Okay, so uh, yeah, I believe, I, I think if there is, um, and I kind of picked a random, like, oh yeah, I picked an account from 2010. Let's go go, uh, see if we can find a current account here. I believe uh, when you pick the grant account, it's going to be able to populate the figures in there for you. Um, I'm just in a test database though, so I'm not sure if I have one that I'm going to be able to find on the fly here. There we go. There we go. So when we pick a current year account, um, it's going to be able to pull in the federal contributions received or the expenditures. Um, and then if you needed to modify those, you could though. So we'll save that up. Ooh. And I can't save it up because <laughs> those two things are required and I didn't go look them up for example. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's cancel out of this. That's very weird. Yeah, our wiki, I think our wiki must be um, having a bad day at the moment, but I have another page that I want to talk about already pulled up. So we're going to hope that that stays, <laughs> stays there. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I think that covers our fiscal year end options. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, okay. So the other thing to note about some of these things is um, these fiscal year end options, you would enter them, you'd review them, um, you know, before the close, I mentioned that they're going to be reported with the EMIS information, um, but there are reports that are related to this information and um, there is a fiscal year end report bundle. So uh, that does get uh, documented and then that gets saved out there to the reports archive um, or to the file archive rather at the end of the fiscal year. So once this is all entered, um, the, there will be a record of that as well, along with the reporting. Um, okay, so calendar year end is the 1099 extract. And um, when we come in here, so we did talk about this one at calendar year end uh, for 2020 as well. Uh, there were some updates last year, so some of this is a bit newer. Um, but the basics of this is uh, you would pick the payment year. Um, I could go back, you know, and pick if I wanted to uh, generate this report for 2020. It's going to default based on my, you know, current year that I might be wanting to look at 2021. Um, there are two different types of returns. So there is an NEC form. Um, so that's for non-employee compensation. And then the 1099 miscellaneous form for um, the other items uh, that would qualify for 1099. And you could check one or both of these things in order to be able to generate a report um, or generate an extract file. These are things that you would generally be doing at the end of the calendar year. So I'm not necessarily gonna generate these right now um, in order to be able to, like you can do them preliminary, but uh, the posting period for December does need to be created. Uh, otherwise it will give you an error. Um, so keep that in mind if this is something that a district might be trying to run in November and they haven't created that final posting period yet. Um, and then some of these, so we have an output file type, so IRS format um, or an XML format. So this dictates whether this is going to be the submission file or XML would be the file for printing. The file name, um, so that's what it's just going to be called um, with the output file that you get. And then this other information on here is coming from the organization um, information for the district. So it's going to have, you know, the ID number, the name of the district, the district's address. Um, but it is important here to enter in the contact information. So um, like a phone number and then um, 
a control number. And so there's information here for that. that um, the amount type limit and then the royalty type. So these are kind of defaulted in here. This is basically um, corresponding to like the IRS standards, um, but obviously you could change those if you wanted to, um, if you had a district that wanted to, you know, report for a higher limit than that, um, or I'm sorry, a lower limit than that. So yeah, this is this is pretty straightforward um, as far as the page. And then um, I don't want to go too deep into it today just because we're going over so much else. But uh, we do go through the entire process um, that you would need to do at calendar year end on our calendar year end webinars. So make sure to um, catch those, you know, when when it's that time of year. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. So that is our periodic menu. Uh, next, we're going to move over to the extracts, but um, just want to take a quick pause. Does anybody have any questions about any of these periodic options before we move on? All righty. All right. So we're on to the extracts. Um, so we have, let's go to our EMIS extract first. These pages, these are also like very, very simple pages, um, but we'll look at a couple other things associated with them. So the EMIS extract, if we come in here, we can see the organization IRN, the organization name. Um, again, that's coming from the core organization page. We can select the fiscal year um, that we want to pull the extract for. And what this is going to be pulling. So um, when you get to so when you get to fiscal year end, there is uh, those pages that I just mentioned on the periodic menu that you would be filling out to submit with the financials. So that was the federal assistance information, the civil proceedings, uh, the cash reconciliation would be included in that. And that's kind of supplemental information that goes along with the financials um, to help provide you know certain information about the district now the actual financial information uh so all of the accounts and the totals and everything that is not coming from this extract here that's going to go through uh through um the data collector that's going to go through sif and there is a way to set that up so here is the page um oh, do i have it so here is a page um, that we have in our documentation that helps you with how to set up um, and actually link uh, the SOAP service with um, the redesign. And basically uh, what you're going to do is there is a SOAP endpoint. Um, so there's a specific URL there. And then you would take and create like a username um, and password, and you would be able to enter that in to the um, SIF agent, and then that would link those. So that's something that usually um, you may coordinate with your technical staff to get that entered in. Um, and where this is, so because our wiki is um, having a tough moment right now, um, the redesign technical documentation. So when you're on the main page, can we still see it? No. Um, when you're on the main page, there is a section, it's right above where we usually go for the USASR documentation. Um, a couple items above that is redesign technical documentation, the how-to articles, if you open these up on the side, then uh, configuring SOAP service, there is this whole how-to article about this. Um, so if you're new to this and you have districts that are migrating over, this is a great resource for helping out with that. Um, and then let's see. Okay. So, so that's going to get all of the information from the accounts. This is just going to get that supplemental information. Um, they're going to take this and submit that, uh, they'll upload that into the data collector and then they'll pull this, you know, with the um, information that's connected to the system. And again, uh, we do talk about this at fiscal year end. So, 
Uh, this is where you find it, but if this is something that you haven't done before, uh, rest assured this is something that'll, you know, be discussed again uh, when it's closer to when you may need to actually do this. <laughs> All right, so uh, the gap extract. This one, even more simple. <laughs> uh, for this, they basically just come in here, select the fiscal year, and then um, do a submit, and it's going to generate an extract file. Um, and so that'll be the gap export. Uh, again, this is also something that they usually do at the end of the fiscal year. And then they would upload this into, um, I believe their web gap system um, so that they can review their information there. But yeah, very, very simple as far as the actual extract process. Um, let's see, okay. The Ohio checkbook.gov extract. Um, so this one, you could generate an extract file or you can generate and submit and it will send it um, to Ohio checkbook.gov. Um, so this one, you know, for districts that are using this, um, you know, this is just going to pull their financial information um, so that it gets shared on the website. Uh, if this is something that a district is already using, you know, basically they would just come in here put the start and end date. If there are any cash accounts that they intend to exclude, they could enter those in and then um, they could just generate it and submit it. Uh, my understanding is this is normally something that they might do either like monthly or quarterly. Um, if you have a district that's not currently using this but wants to, there are some setup steps, I believe. So um, I would suggest uh, that they kind of like check what they may need to do to get it started, you know, with Ohio Checkbook. And then once they're set up, they could use this to submit on a regular basis. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, and our last one on the extracts list is the positive pay. Um, so the positive pay here. So this is going to allow them to pull information related to disbursements or to checks so that they can send that to the bank um, to make sure that, um, you know, the bank knows which checks are okay um, to pay essentially. This helps, helps them prevent fraud um, and that sort of thing. So what you can do with this is um, you can uh, work, you can get the setup all in here and then on a regular basis, you know, maybe each check run or once a month, they would be able to come in here and run this. And I feel like this might be, I think we have um, some information on this wiki page that kind of helps out with the formats and stuff. Um, so I can't show that right now, but um, you know, if this is something that you're looking to set up, that can be a, a good resource. So there are two different kind of formats that they might want, a CSV or a fixed. So a CSV is going to be, you know, comma separated uh, is what that output file is going to be. A fixed is more like, um, it almost kind of looks like it has tabs between it. If you looked at this in notebook, or I'm sorry, in notepad, um, it would just be like a file, you know, with, with spaces between each column, basically. And what's going to determine like which which one of these they're going to use or what fields like this is all going to be based on what format the bank wants the file in. Uh, so once they have you know that information from the bank, they could come in here and set this up. And you can just use this little plus so you would go ahead and add, um, you know, however many columns of information that um, they would need. So, you know, say they want, okay, first the bank wants the bank account number in there. And then they're going to want, let's see, they probably want the check number. And again, I'm making this up, but generally like you would have a format that, that they're wanting you, that they're wanting the district to output um, this file into. And then, you know, uh, maybe they want the check amount next and um, you know, and really, so any of these are, any of these are options. Oh, the payee. So that's going to be my vendor. So they want the payee name. And then, um, let's see, we didn't do the date yet. Okay, cool. 
So once you set that up, um, then you would be able to put in like a starting date. So say you're doing, uh, you just did like a check run for, or you want all the check runs that happened in February. So it would be 2-1-21. It would pull any uh, disbursements that have a date of that date or later. And so then that way, when I go to do it for the following month, I could put March 1st and then it would put, because I've already, you know, probably sent them the, the previous month. And so then I would pull anything um, after that date and be able to send that to the bank. Uh, sometimes this isn't always as straightforward as just like, okay, pick check number, pick check amount. You know, some banks do have weird formats. Uh, you can see within here, there is one that's like a spacer. And so that's kind of to like skip a column. So that may be needed to use sometimes. Um, of course, like if you do have any troubles with setting something like this up, um, the, the formats again, I believe are in the documentation. So that's a good resource, but you, know, you can always submit a ticket to us and we can help you out with, you know, what any of these mean, or if there's something that's tripping you up that they're asking for, uh, let us know. Um, and then once you have the starting date in here, the bank account, so this is going to be whichever account they've associated with the disbursements when they um, posted those payables to a disbursement. Um, and then generate is going to actually make the extract file. And I don't know, didn't check if we have anything in this database, but I think we do. So let's take a look. Okay. So um, then I just went ahead, generated this, and it's giving me um, just the different columns with each of the different pieces of information that I asked for. Gosh, we should probably close some of these. Okay. Okay, so we are booking right through because um, that is the extracts. Um, but again, those are pretty uh, straightforward there. And next is going to be our system menu. So this one, you know, our, our last menu here, some of these we're gonna go into a little bit more than others. Um, I'm just gonna preface like most of these things with saying that a lot of these items, we do go into um, more detail on our intermediate trainings. But I want to just kind of like at least look at these pages, uh, talk about what they may do. So even if we don't talk about the details today, I want you to know that um, these pieces are there. Um, but just since we're kind of doing a beginner overview today, I don't really want to um, do anything that's too overwhelming either because they can get a bit complicated. Okay. So the configuration is first. So the system configuration, um, a lot of these things uh, you might touch like when you're first setting up a district. Some of these things are automatic and you may never need to touch. Um, but let's go ahead, let me see. So um, some of these things, let's see. The, pay, uh, the payable module configuration, um, let's look at this one first. You'll open these up and you'll just see this box that says initialized. Uh, what this means is this is basically um, when the instance gets spun up, um, like maybe when you migrated or if it's like restarted, there are these modules that um, kind of set themselves up on startup. And then once they're set and initialized, it will automatically check this box. So this isn't something that you have to like come in and manually do, um, but this is a way that if you ever needed to like reinitialize, uh, if something like doesn't seem to have set itself up right, which is very rare and would probably only happen if you're talking to us in a ticket and we're like, hey, go ahead and do this. So um, a couple of these I'll hop through here. Uh, really aren't things that you would normally worry about on a regular basis, but I just want to tell you, um, you know, what, what that is and what that means so that you understand. Um, so the payable module configuration, activity ledger configuration. Um, let's see the, which one, encumbrance module configuration expenditure module configuration, these um, all are really just going to look um, the, the same with just having that like one little checkbox um, that you don't necessarily need to worry about unless it's an exception. 
Uh, let's see. I thought, okay, here we go. So the next one I want to look at, I'm going to kind of hop around now. Um, the next one I want to look at is this EMIS soap service configuration. So we just looked at um, our soap service connection, this uh, documentation page that we talked about. That's how you set it up. But once you get set up, what you want to do is make sure that you put your fiscal year in this configuration. Uh, this is something that you may do when a district first migrates, and then this would be something year to year after they report their financials that you'd update to the next year, because whatever is in here is going to dictate which year um, that data collector is able to pull. So uh, right now, you know, if I were to run the data collector, I want it to be for 2021, I have to make sure that this configuration is set to 2021. Um, let's see. Accounts receivable. I'm going to leave the accounts receivable ones alone for now. Um, the application configuration. So this one uh, can be relevant to know about if you are setting up like test instances. Uh, normally, this is what it looks like. I got production. It's external, external notification enabled. Um, in job execution. And what this means is that the instance that I'm in is set to be like, you know, it's set to um, be able to do everything that a production instance can. External notification means that it can send emails. And then job execution, um, we haven't really talked too much about the job scheduler in this training, but uh, that just basically means that it can, um, you know, run, re run scheduled reports, uh, report bundles that might be scheduled, that sort of thing. Um, so what the other options are is training, uh, support, demo. And if you have this set to a training instance, uh, what you would normally see is that these would be unchecked. And then what that means is that your, your test or training instance can't send emails and can't you know, run certain things. And really it's just a safeguard so that if you have something like, say you have a district um, that is set up to like send hourly requisitions to a third party program um, or send out emails to people in the district. If you took a training and if you took, took a copy of that district, you wouldn't want your test instance necessarily to be sending those same things, especially to the same people. Uh, you know, if it was actually sending it to like a district person, you wouldn't want it to send a duplicate report uh, with your with just your test data. So, so, so that's why this is important. Um, but normally, again, this one will just default to be, you know, what you need it to be. So you don't necessarily have to come in here and test it uh, or and, and set it. But for like troubleshooting, that can be helpful to know. Um, and then, you know, the other one that I want to look at today, and again, uh, we have in the intermediate training, I think I went through like all of these options um, and we'll do that again. I believe in the fall we're planning to do that. Um, but let's talk about the transaction configuration because this is one, it's different from how classic works and it is something that you would set up, um, you know, when you're first moving districts over, um, but also like throughout time, if they want to change their series of um, numbers that they're using, um, and it can be kind of confusing. So on the wiki page, we have, um, if you go look at the system configuration and go to the section for transaction configuration, it has an example, um, but I feel like it's also really helpful to see. So all of these default to the highest um, number being just 99999. Um, but let's go look at, and I'm just gonna go to my second page here so that we can hop back and forth. So let's go look at my checks, my disbursements. I'm gonna move my check number all the way to my very first column because this is what we wanna look at. Now, what I would do to find my series of check numbers, so I have uh, my check number column here and I just, I um, sorted this. So I just clicked this header a couple times so that it went from 
um, ascending to descending. And I can see I have this whole series going on here where they're in the eights. Now, what I really want to look for when I'm setting this up is what do I want my next number to be? And what's the number that's higher than that? So if I wanted my next number to be 889816, then my configuration being all nines is good because that's my highest number on file already is this one. So I want a number higher than that. I want the next number higher than that. So I'm just going to put all nine. So, so if I wanted it to be the next in this series, my setup would be good. Where this gets complicated is that if I want a series that's not the highest series on, on file. So I'm going to scroll down here. Let's see if we can find a break in these numbers. Oh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. So do you see right here? Look at these. See how I have um, a check number series that is 201783. And then it jumps to 83901, 83902. And then, okay, so it jumps a couple times here. But what happens if my district tells me I want my next check number to be 201784? That's where my check series is. The other ones, the higher check numbers, like I was just using those to mark, you know, a specific thing. But the real series I want is this one. So if I wanted my next number to be 201784, what I want in my transaction configuration is the next number higher than that. So that is 830901. I would put in here, oops, that's rec number, sorry. I wanna make sure I put it in check number. <laughs> 830901. Right, right, I think that was it, Eight three zero nine zero one. double check. Okay, cool. So my next, so my highest check number is going to be the next highest above the series I want. What the system's gonna do when it goes to assign my next check numbers is it's gonna go in here and it's gonna look and it's gonna say, okay, there is the one that I have in my configuration. Now what's below that? Okay, so this one exists. So I'm gonna go one more than what's below that. And then once I get those checks on file, so once 2017-834 exists, when I do another check, it's gonna say, oh, what's the next one below 830901? So really going in here and sorting these grids, like if I was setting one of these up for a district, this is exactly how I would find them <laughs> is I would come, all right, let's go find a purchase order number. So looks like, oh, look, we got a nice break right there. So let's go ahead and sort these. If I, so I'm clicking it twice because first it's going lowest to highest and then I'm going highest to lowest. Okay. So, oh, okay. So this is interesting. Well, I think, um, cause see February, these are the ones we've been processing um, currently, but let's go look down here. So let's say, let's go ahead and, um, continue from this series. So uh, 292082. So I want my next PO number to be 292083. Um, so what I'm gonna put in is the one higher than that. So that's 1413221, let's go do that. Now let me go ahead, I'm gonna save this up and let's, let's look at this one since the PO doesn't give us that much difficulty to create. Okay. Um, so I'm going to leave this blank so that it can default and we're just going to pick a random vendor. And then when I save this, boom. So 292083 and let me close this up. So see, now it went and said, okay, here's what's in my configuration. Um, and then here's the next one um, below that. Okay, awesome. So the wiki is back up. That's great news. 
So let me go here. Um, since we're talking about this transaction configuration, I just want to come in and show um, there is an example in here. So if you're looking back on this, um, when you're actually going to set one of these up, um, this kind of notes that it does work different and gives a little um, example there to help you figure this out. Okay. So let's see. The other one that I have noted here Let's go back to our configuration. Is the USPS configuration? Um, this looks a little bit different than it normally would. Uh, basically, these would normally set up to link your USPS and your USAS instances. Um, so if you come in here, the application ID, API key, uh, this would be filled out. Um, so just this information kind of shows uh, that your instances are linked. There are options within this integration um, option if you need to um, sort of update those. But again, that is normally um, standardly set up for you. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think um, all of these other ones we kind of will go into more um, in that intermediate training. So let's hop over to uh, our custom field definitions. So this page, again, this is something that's a bit more advanced, so we're not going to talk about too much, um, but I just want to show you that this exists. There are fields that are available throughout the software um, on your different pages. So um, some of the things that um, you guys looked at yesterday with looking at the transaction pages and the accounts. Um, there are fields that come over from classic that were just like the user, like the, you know, the standard fields, basically like the custom fields that you could use. Um, and those will come over and those show in this grid. So you could update or uh, get rid of those. There is a way that you can add additional custom fields um, if you wanted to add something else to one of your pages. Uh, or a district want to add something else to one of their pages, you know, you want to um, get that set up for them, you could come in here and you could create a new field to add to a page. Uh, let's look at one of these that exist. So um, I want to go to um, one of these purchase order fields. So uh, I have this applies to uh, column that I'm looking at here. Um, and if we look at, let's just, I just want to look at one of these for, uh, so we can kind of get an idea of the fields. So I picked this one uh, that is on the purchase order record. And this is the display name. So this is what the name of that field is going to look like. So this is the modified date. And then it has a type. Um, the order uh, signifies like where this falls on the page. Um, each of those different fields is kind of categorized into certain groups. And then this would be uh, used to designate if you want it to be like, you know, more to the left or more to the right. Uh, active, if you wanted to turn off one of these fields, you didn't want this to show on the purchase order anymore, you could just go ahead and uncheck active. Um, and then the property name is used with uh, pulling this on reports. And the group would be if you wanted to add it to a different uh, section on the page. Uh, if you needed to come in here and, you know, modify any of this, we can see any of these fields that are not grayed out are available to update. Um, and then you would get similar fields if you go to create a new field. So if this comes up, certainly, um, you know, we can help you if this is something that uh, you need to do, you know, more immediately. Honestly, I think these custom fields, it's a great thing to know that this exists in here. I don't know how many people are actually like really fully utilizing the ability to come in here and like change some of the previous fields from classic or add new things. I know when districts first start on, there's a lot of like familiarity to classic that's appreciated. So that's why I'm not gonna go too much in here, but I do want you guys to know that this exists. And I think down the line, once everybody kind of gets switched over and gets more hands-on with some of this, 
um, stuff, I think, you know, this will be used more and more as we go. Um, all right, so let's skip to the modules. And this page is basically like setting up, um, you know, some of the different things that you can use within the system. Um, there are uh, so certain things that, you know, like would come over and already be turned on, or there are some things that you may want to come in here and enable. So, um, for example, if they, you know, the USPS integration, um, if they used user balance checking, like these things may come over already on. Um, but things like if they want to use accounts receivable, you can come in here and turn this module on. Email notification services. Uh, that may be something, you know, if they want to send reports from the system that um, they'll need to turn on. There is a list, this is noted um, in the post import procedures of different modules that can be turned on when a district migrates. And I think that that's your best resource for um, starting off with these and which ones need to be turned on or a district may want to turn on. Um, again, this is another topic that I go into, uh, we go into each of these uh, modules in much more detail on the intermediate. Um, I know I've mentioned that, you know, we'll be uh, looking at doing this towards the end of the year, but actually the recordings are out there from last year still too. So if this is something that, you know, um, you are wanting more information on now, go check out the YouTube, the training page. Um, there are links to those YouTube recordings. Um, and so, yeah, if you want more detail on this, it is available uh, out there right now. But uh, the other thing to remember um, is that some of these you can turn right on and then some of these you uh, may need to restart the instance. So I think just your, uh, just the general knowledge is, you know, A, these are out here um, and then B, if you are turning these on, be aware of that. And um, again, the wiki is a great resource because that is noted for any of these that do need to uh, have a restart after you turn them on. Um, okay. Okay, so now we're going to monitor. <laughs> And this whole, I, you know what, this whole menu, this whole system menu, it is, it's the more complicated things. So um, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but again, like, I just want you to know that there is more information available that we go through on those intermediate trainings. But um, so, you know, if you're feeling like this is a little bit light, um, take a look at that because this one is on there too. Um, but let's, let's still look at the basics together. So this monitor tab is basically, um, so this is something that is just available to admins. Like this is something that as an ITC person, like you are going to have access to this. The district is not really going to, um, you know, be coming in here and seeing these things. When we come in, we have this whole, um, you know, uh, this whole option at the top where we have a bunch of different tabs uh, that we can go through. And the first one is events. So this events tab is kind of just telling me different things that have been happening in the software. So I can see that, look, there was a report started, um, reports generated. And so this, this is what we were just doing. We were in here, we were starting all these reports. You know, this gives me a timestamp. So here's my date, here's my time. Um, Oh, look, see, uh, here we go, 1008. This was our, um, that's right before we took a break. So that's our five-year forecast <laughs> um, that we were doing. And then sometimes it's like triggering different things. So I know we were on a break, but it's, it was kind of still processing throughout there. Um, so we have like events um, that took some time. We have some um, recent events we can look at. Um, authentication events, this one connects to like logins. So um, you can take a look at that. Honestly, I don't use this tab a whole lot. Uh, I've used this sometimes to see like how long exactly did a report generate 
you know, so that's where, you know, I might take a look at um, this tab related to that, but um, yeah, this one, I, I don't use a whole lot. The status tab, this can be uh, very handy, um, especially, you know, when you are restarting an instance, so, uh, or like a starting, starting it up. So say you first imported, um, what I would look at in here is mostly like this section right here is where I come. So I can see um, the, these uh, different events. So these are related to the activity ledger, the encumbrance ledger, journal entries, expenditures, payable module, revenue module. All of these things are the things that I told you uh, from the um, configuration where it just had that one box that said initialize. And, um, you know, once that gets set up, uh, when the when the instance comes up, then that gets checked when it's ready. Well, this helps you keep an eye on the status of that happening. Um, so basically, like when you're first setting up the instance or if you restart it, um, because everything is calculated, like you have all of those transactions that come in and then any of the totals that you're seeing throughout the software are going to be calculated in the background. Well, what these jobs do is they get those calculations going um, and they bring in certain transactions to certain spots um, so that everything's like ready to go. So what happens is these come in here and we can see like, oh, you know, success, completed. When you first start something, it might just say started. Um, I don't think there's in progress. I believe it's it's started or complete. Um, if there is a problem, you could see that this says failed. Uh, so this isn't something that you're gonna be checking all the time, but if there is some kind of problem on startup, it can be really helpful to come in here and say, oh, you know, started means it's still running, but if it's failed, then I know I have a problem and I need to redo it. So really th that's what you're looking for in here. And again, like if you put in a ticket, um, because there is some kind of issue, like we might direct you to this page. And then this is what, you know, we're um, usually having you look at in that case. The, um, the metrics are mainly for uh, your tech personnel at the ITC. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm don't, this is not stuff that I look at, you know, regularly at all. So I'm on the support end. You know, I don't think you really need to worry about this page. Same thing with logging. Uh, this is something that um, I've used very sparingly and only when I'm working with our development staff. Uh, basically what this can do is allow a way to um, have like a higher reporting level for um, like errors. So uh, if something does happen in the system and SSDT is trying to troubleshoot it with you, we may have you turn on like a higher logging level for that error so that we can get more information about what's happening. Um, however, the more uh, logging happens, that can have an impact on the system. So it's not something that you would want to come in here and turn on yourself. Uh, that could definitely like slow down an instance. Um, so again, this is a page that I would just say, don't worry about this unless, you know, we're working with you and have you um, do something in here. This one though, the app log, let me tell you, I love this page. <laughs> um, this page is very, very, very convenient. Um, you know, we have, we'll have you send us the, like the app log or the server log sometimes. Uh, Pat showed you yesterday where in the help section the, about, you could just like click a button and send us the app log. Um, and, and that is helpful, but this page gives you some access to come look in, come look at here or come look in here and see, um, you know, some things that may be happening. And um, when you look at this, the, the very first column is the timestamp. So if you are troubleshooting something for a district and they say, I got an error, if you can get about a time that they were working on something, that's going to be really helpful to finding it in here. Um, and then what you can do, so, okay, cool. So I just got this error. Um, I already forget what I was doing, but I can see that it actually was an error. And um, you can filter on all of these columns too. So 
you can see what I usually type in here. Uh, so if I want to see any errors that happened, um, or you know, it also shows warnings or just informational things. Um, but let's let's look at the error right up top. So we got to look at this first. <laughs> um, so if you come in here, so it shows you, you know, that this was okay. So it was an exception. What did we do? What did we do? Okay. Oh, all right. So I come down here and this is the detail. You can, if it's easier to copy this to like notepad or an Excel document. Um, but look, error. My CFDA number was null and my grant number was null. So null means blank. So there's an error that told me that I tried to save that. So that is from my federal assistance. We tried to save it. We didn't put in all of the information. So the system threw an error and in the background, it logged it here. So if I needed to go look back, so say somebody else did that, say a district person did that. And then they were like, I don't know why it didn't save. I don't know what the issue was. You know, you could come in here and you can see more information um, on the error that uh, that they got. Now, I know this has a lot of other information here. And now that I clicked on it, I got the, the weird red squiggles. Um, so a lot of this, you know, doesn't necessarily um, like, you know, read to, um, to me. <laughs> um, I'll look through this sometimes. A lot of this is, you know, more, uh, you, you know, more on the tech side. But um, if you get this and maybe the district closed out of the error, but then they're asking you and you're submitting something to us, it is helpful. You could come copy this out of here. I think double click. Okay, well, you could click and drag and copy this. And then um, you could attach this to your ticket. And that may really help us um, help you figure out what the what the issue is. So and again, I got this just by kind of clicking directly on that row and that will pull up uh, my detail here. Now, there are some other things too. Okay, look, so we have um, these informational lines that can be helpful. And we have a lot of these that are related to the report bundles. Um, so this is kind of initializing my report bundles. I know I see a line like if I did go like disable, re-enable a report bundle, there's an informational um, about that. Uh, this is, let's see, storing some report definitions. Um, oh, uh, here's one that I was thinking about is um, posting periods. So if you are um, updating the posting periods, I believe there's a little informational in here about it. So, I mean, this definitely takes some getting used to with looking at, um, but it's just kind of another way, like if you are trying to, you know, get more information, this can be handy. And even if it's just in the context of, you know, maybe like finding an error so that if you're, you know, putting in a ticket, um, you know, that could be helpful as well. So, so yeah, I love this page. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, threads. I honestly, I I never go to this page either. So I, we're gonna skip this one because I don't even know. <laughs> but that's again, it's another more technical page. So you know, on the support end, we wouldn't really use this. Um, admin logs. Oh darn it. Um, I'm in a test land, so I don't have I don't have one here. But if you go into admin logs. Uh, for your districts, what you'll see here, it's usually just one line. Uh, it would just be one line. And um, it shows the log from when you imported. So uh, when you bring the district over um, when they migrated and you can take a look there, you know, if you're having, an, if you, that's something you should review when you do first migrate them. Um, but what can be very handy is the source has like, um, has a little timestamp in there and date. So if you have a district or, you know, maybe, or maybe you're working with a district that's been live for quite some time, you're not really sure, you know, um, if, if you're coming in and they were in like an earlier wave or something, you could go to this page and you could see the timestamp there and say, oh, hey, they were imported, you know, March of 2020. Um, so if you ever needed to know that for something, I mean, I can't even tell you, there's been many, many times that I'm looking at a backup to help you guys out at the ITC and I'll come in here just just so I know the date of when they were imported because that may just make a difference in 
uh, you know, what their transactions are looking like if they were imported or if they were actually created and redesigned. So that can be helpful. Um, so the info, this has um, some basic information. Um, so this is gonna be the Docker and the JVM settings. And um, it tells how much memory is given to the instance. So um, not necessarily something that I would look uh, at normally unless like I was asked for it, but you know, this could be something that if you're working with um, us and our technical team may have you look at this page. And then the server logs. Um, so this is the last one we're gonna look at here. I'm gonna skip the cache. Um, the server logs, this is similar um, to what Pat talked about yesterday where you can send the server log to us uh, from the about page. That would always send you the current one, but there are some other um, different things in here that in specific situations, SSD team might ask, you know, hey, can you send like uh, one of the, you know, can you send a different log instead? But normally um, it's just this current log that we would be looking at. And so um, you wouldn't necessarily need to come in here for that. Alrighty. Okay. So that monitor tabs a lot. That's like a bunch of options within one of these um, different ones. Does anybody have questions about monitor? You know, I know that that's it's a lot of the it's a lot of the more like back end techie stuff, but it can be very useful uh, for some of those pages, especially the app log. All righty. Well, let's move on. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the roles. And okay, good. I'm glad that our wiki is back up for this. So let's go to system roles. Okay. So what we're seeing here and what we're seeing in this test instance, so I have all my different role names here is I have this little grid and these SSDT roles do come over uh, when you import. These are what you start with. And these um, do match up to the classic identifiers, to the, the roles that you had in classic. And so basically that would be like if they had, you know, uh, manager access, if they just had standard, if they had read only, um, or if they had requisition only. Um, now, a lot of, uh, well, I guess I can't say a lot of, but my experience with some ITCs, at least, uh, they would have the read-only role and kind of say that was a rec-only role. Um, so you have read-only and requisition. Um, this classic read-only role, it does have access to enter requisitions, too, on top of being able to see some additional stuff. So it's possible that your users will come in with, uh, or that some districts users will come in with read-only if that's something that you guys did. Um, but you can definitely switch them over if you want to switch them to just uh, requisition. So what basically whatever they had in Classic is what they're gonna come over with um, in redesign. Now, uh, this page is very helpful um, and you can see within the software too, but if you wanna see what each role has, then um, there is a section SSDT roles permissions. And this lists out all of the permissions that um, is contained for each of these different roles. So um, let's go to, so our read only role, it has all of these permissions and you can see um, that these, based on these different identifiers, it has, you know, the type of permission that is at the end. Um, so report, view, report, view. So they're not actually able to like create um, or edit. Like these are just um, view only options. Um, let's see. Um, look at this. Let's go here. So uh, again, same thing. You could see these within the, the system if you wanted to come in here and 
uh, look for, you know, look through. These are um, all available permissions and then the granted, these are the ones specifically associated with this role. I'll tell you a trick. If there's something specific you are looking for, you can do control F on your keyboard for find. And then um, it will work within these windows. So I just spell it right though. Um, so if I start looking for requisition, um, it'll jump to this part in the menu and I can see, okay. Uh, but let me go look and see what this has. Okay. So this does have access to uh, requisition access. Now we're seeing them on both sides here. So what does that mean? Um, what this means, if we look at, and let's look at like the purchase order section. So each one of these sections has um, the overall one, and then it has these different ones in between, right? So, or underneath it. So if my role has the permission that doesn't have any specifics, it would have all of those. So it would have create, delete, report, update, and view. So my requisition, it doesn't have any specifics. So it has all of those options. Um, if I were to just add one of these, like how I have with purchase order. So this one has purchase order report, import purchase order view, but it does not have create, delete, or update. So that's how that works with adding permissions. Um, okay, so this is one of my standard roles. Now I have, okay, let's do, let's talk about creating our own roles though. Now, um, along with all of these standard roles, if you do want to have custom roles, um, you know, special roles just for a specific district, or maybe, you know, your ITC creates them for um, all of your districts, you can do that. Uh, you can't have an underscore in them because those designate the standard rules. But other than that, you can call them whatever you want. And then when you come in here, um, what you would do is you would just find, you know, whichever permission it is that you want to add. Um, I'm just going to pick something random here. And then, so you would select that or you could do control. Um, if you hold down control on your keyboard, you could click multiple things. Um, or if you do shift, it will do um, like a section of things. So let's just choose some different things here. And then once I have the things that I want included in my role highlighted, um, or I could do them one at a time if you prefer that, um, you can click this arrow and it'll move those over. Um, if there's something that I want to remove, I can just click on um, what I want removed and move that back. And then once I have everything set with my role, I can go ahead and save that up. Um, now I have my test role on this roles grid. And so I have this available as something that can give permissions to a user. Um, and we are hopping to users uh, that that's on our list for today. So we'll see um, a little bit later on how you can assign these to a specific person. Um, but that just gives us a way to kind of have, you know, custom access instead of just the standard. So that's kind of nice. Um, of course, though, with that, you know, I'm sure that um, there's still probably a procedure at the ITC that you'll want to follow as far as, you know, who's getting what permission and if a district's signing off on that um, and that sort of thing. I do want to show you one more trick as well with creating custom roles. So um, for this, so say we have our requisition only role. And what if we also want to give this role something like, let's let them view POs, right? Um, let me do my, my trick to look these up. <laughs> um, now this one, okay, wait, it's a, it's a, it's a standard role though, right? So we can't, we can't update the standard roles. The standard roles are going to be standard. Um, however, like if we tried to save this, we'd get an issue. 
because we can't change any with the underscore. But what we can do is we can be tricky and we can say, let's say, um, Okay, so now that we changed the name of the role, we can save this as a brand new role. <laughs> so um, now I have my rec only with PO, but look, I also still have my use as rec. So, you know, that's not gonna affect this original role. Once I change the name, now it's something new. Um, and then I could go use this, you know, instead if I wanted to. Um, I'm just checking my notes, make sure there's nothing else that I want to uh, talk about there. Okay, uh, so let's move on then. Um, what else were we talking about? Okay, let's look at, uh, let's look at uh, rules real quick and then we'll finish up with users. Um, okay, so this is the rules grid and uh, redesign, it very much runs on rules. So we've looked at, you know, a couple of different things today. We went into the app log. We saw how the errors were, you know, we tried to save something that messed up and it gave us that um, error. When we went to the cash reconciliation and saved where it didn't balance, we got a pop-up with a warning. Um, a lot of these things uh, that we're seeing throughout the software are um, they happen because of rules, because we have rules um, in the software that are saying that, um, you know, it's going to have a warning for this, it's going to have an error for this. And you can see in our descriptions, you know, warning, error, okay. Um, when we look at these rules, so let's open, I'm just going to open up a very random one. Because what I want to show you is that, um, you know, we have our name, we have our description. These are things we're seeing on the grid. There are some fields here that are important. So bundled means that it came with the software. It's like a standard rule that came from SSDT. Uh, mandatory. This is big. So is this rule required by the system or not? There are some things that are mandatory, things that are, you know, uh, errors that happen throughout the software. Um, you know, maybe that has to do with, uh, you know, regulations or um, just how the software needs to work. Uh, you know, a mandatory rule. It's basically just saying you can't turn this off. Um, but some of these are not mandatory. And so if that's the case, then um, some of them are enabled. Uh, by default in the software, and you might be able to change that if you want. Um, if you have a district that's saying, hey, I don't think this should have, like, I don't want, um, or I want to get a warning instead, or I want to get an error instead of a warning. Um, and there are different things that, that you can do uh, to customize within here. Uh, this is also relevant if you are creating your own custom rule, um, you would be able to uh, enable or disable that. Um, and this is where we come back to our handy wiki again, <laughs> Cre actually writing the custom rules, uh, that is, uh, definitely more complex. So we're not really going to talk about that, but there are some rules that are already in the wiki that are some custom rules that have been created. And, um, we actually put the text in here, uh, with these custom rules so that what you would do is basically just copy and paste this into uh, creating a rule. And then you would add like a name and description and be able to um, add that to the software. If you are changing rules, so say, you know, maybe you uh, like enabled or um, disabled a rule and you wanna put that into effect. Uh, one of the, one of the things that's like super, super easy to, to overlook when you're just getting used to this page is after making any changes to this grid, you have to remember to click activate to make that change apply to the rest of the system. So, you know, if I came in here, did this, went ahead and disabled this and saved it. Um, yeah. 
I'm just, I was wanting, I figured I should probably check which rule I'm disabling first. <laughs> okay, so um, so say I'm going to disable that. And then um, if I just left this page and went and go try to do that process, my rule is not going to be disabled because what I need to do is click activate. Um, if I don't click activate, then like the next time my instance is restarted, it would put it into effect. But usually that's not something that's happening that regularly. So you do want to be um, making sure to remember to click activate after uh, making any changes on this page. And if you, you know, haven't really made changes and click activate, it can't really hurt anything. It's just making sure the rest of the system is up to date with what you've done in here. All right. All right. We're doing pretty good on time. Our last thing, users. So this is the page where you're going to see, you know, all of the user accounts that are within the system. Um, these do import from Classic. Um, when you're on this grid, so say our existing users, uh, the first icon that you have here is to change password. And this is pretty straightforward. So you just do a new password, uh, you type it twice and then click save to update this person's password. Do you have to type the same thing? <laughs> Okay, uh, and then click save. Okay, boom. Um, then you have a view option or an edit option, which will basically open the same page, just depends on if it's in view um, only or, or if you are actually in here to edit. So let's move this over and look at our options. Okay. So the username, that is going to be um, whatever username is tied to the transactions for the account. Uh, that's what they're gonna use to log in with. One thing that's important to note is the username. So because Redesign's like a bit more advanced, it has uh, kind of like a background key that's associated with this, uh, with the, different records in here, you can change the username and it will still be considered like the same user. It'll still be linked to associated transactions. Um, so I was just talking to uh, somebody recently about like something with the redesign username and in classic, like it could only be a certain number of digits. So, uh, you know, so it's like the old username had the, the last couple digits of their last name cut off. Well, you could update that in classic, or I'm sorry, in redesign, um, so that that person now has their full name. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's the thought that if you change the username, it's gonna be a different user. And that's not the case for this. So, you know, honestly, I'm not gonna really change this one, but, um, but I could, you know, I could go ahead and change this username. It would still be associated with the transactions and everything. Um, the name, so the name, title, email, like this is basically informational fields. Um, this will show in the grid, uh, assigned roles. So the assigned roles, this is going to dictate what permissions they have, what pages they can see, if it's report, view, create, update, all those things that we just looked at with the roles is going to be dictated by what's assigned here. Um, so if we wanted to, and again, you just kind of move these back and forth. Um, and I think this is just, I'm very zoomed in on my browser. So I think it's, hmm. Yeah, I think this is because I was zoomed in. My little, my buttons are kind of weird there. To make a note of that. Okay, so, um, but anyways, we can still see what's happening. So let's do rec only with PO. So this was our custom role that we created. So if we move that over, let's give that to Abby. Uh, filters, again, we didn't, haven't really talked about the account filters um, too much just yet, but this is basically going to determine what accounts that they can see or use. Uh, so if you wanted to give the user a filter so that when they logged in, those were the only things available to them, uh, you could do that. Requisition prefixes. So the, oh, you know what, before we get, before we get to that, uh, let me mention with the roles, 
So uh, I switched out the role here, but users can have multiple roles. So if I wanted them to have this rec only with PO, and then I'm like, you know what? Let's add on, let's give them the, the stuff that was in that test role too. Then you could do that. And this might be something where, um, to give a more realistic example, like maybe all the district secretaries have, you know, this specific access, they have the rec only with the PO. And so you're giving that to all of the secretaries in the district. But then I have, you know, my one secretary that uh, does a bit more and I want her to see the activity ledger too. Then, um, you know, her or him, I want them to see the activity ledger too. So, you know, I could make them their own, like just single custom role, or I could give them the standard secretary role and then give them another role that would just give them access to the activity ledger. So that kind of helps you, you know, customize, um, but keep it standard. So whatever, you know, whatever is more convenient, um, but that can happen where they could have multiple roles in here. Alrighty, requisition prefixes. So let's see, um, these are gonna be used for, um, basically for auto assigning is what this initial box is for. Um, so I have Abby Landry. So let's, or why don't we just make like her, her requisitions are gonna start with Abby. So if I type that in there and I were to go ahead and save this up, then when um, Abby puts in a requisition, it's gonna go ahead and use that requisition prefix um, for the transactions that she enters. Um, when you're entering these in, it can't contain special characters. Um, now, where this gets a little bit um, more like complicated, but also more useful, is that this restrict requisitions checkbox is also an option and can be used in combination with the requisition prefixes box. So if I want to restrict requisitions, what this is saying is that now that I have this checked, Abby can only see requisitions that start with Abby. But you know what, maybe uh, Abby also uses requisitions from like the person who was previously in her job. I want her to be able to see those too. So uh, let's put like Joy or something in there. So now if I put both of those in there separated by the comma, um, Abby's gonna be able to see Abby and Joy uh, requisitions that have the prefixes of Abby and Joy. Uh, however, when she creates a requisition, it still is going to automatically assign Abby because that's the first one in the list. So it's so now it's doing like double duty on what that's being used for. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, if the prefix exists already, so if there's already requisitions that start with Abby. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to find the highest existing number and um, assign the next one highest to that. Uh, let's see. Um, it can contain letters and numbers. So if I want it to be like, you know, A, B, if you wanted to have like the two digits of the fiscal year, um, in the requisition prefix, you could, I mean, that might be a lot of work because then you have to change everybody's every year. Um, but it is an option. And the other thing to watch out for, so when you're setting these up, like there are, um, you know, there, there's like a certain number of digits as far as uh, the requisition numbers, like it's, it can be, um, the, the full number of digits can vary. So I wanna say that it's usually eight digits, um, but, there may be a case where like you may want to have this so it's like joy zero you know if you're trying to keep it consistent with uh like prior requisitions that have been entered or like if you're trying to keep all the links um consistent but honestly if uh they're just trying to put a prefix on there you know they can do you know two three four digits um if they're starting a new series and it's really it'll work either way all right um, 
the next thing here is this balance checking. So the so this is user based balance checking, and this is something we did see turned on in the modules when we were there. Uh, and then there are some rules associated with this that can be used to kind of like customize how the balance checking is working. Um, but basically what these checkboxes are for for the balance checking is that when this user enters requisitions or like purchase orders if they were somebody that could do that. Um, it's, you know, it's going to check the appropriation and the budget figures. And do you want them to allow, like, do you want to allow them to put in a transaction that's going to make those accounts go negative? So um, when we're looking at this, allow negative appropriation, that's checked. So Abby's allowed. Um, it will give her, um, well, we have the last one worn on negative amounts. So like, if she's getting a warning, but she's still allowed to proceed and actually post that. Uh, if you have users that um, they want to not be allowed to do that, the, the district wants to make uh, make it so that they're not be allowed to do that, then you would just um, uncheck these and then save that. But we're gonna let we're gonna let Abby go for it. Uh, down at the bottom here, so we have account expiration, password expiration. Uh, the password expiration, so actually there is a setup for this in configuration. It's one of the things that we didn't uh, look at in too much detail, or we didn't look at it today. Um, but the password expiration, can, so there, if you want it to be set for like a certain number of days out since the last time you set her password. Um, so for this password expiration, it's, it's going to give it a specific date, and then um, when that expires, excuse me, then the user will need to reset their password. Um, so enabled, that is the account, is the user account enabled. If you were to uncheck that, then that means, you know, that user can no longer log in. Uh, external, okay, so locked would be, um, I believe that happens if they, like, they've tried to log in too many times with the wrong password, the account can be locked. And then it would have to come, like somebody would have to come in here, can unlock it before that user can log in, um, sort of a security measure. And then external authentication. So that is if, um, like, if the district's using like Active Directory, they have um, some other like login, you know, that this account is associated with, uh, then that would be checked there. Um, but, um, if you're, you know, logging in, if you're setting the password and everything through redesign, then that would normally be unchecked. And then you have your last login information. So uh, that's going to show you the last time the user has logged into the system. Um, if the account is expired or the password is expired, again, these checkboxes will be marked. Um, and the thing that is very helpful about all of this is all of these fields that we're seeing on here. Um, so say the, you know, the password expired, that box is going to be checked. Uh, we'll save Abby up. That box is going to be checked. And then what you can do is you would be able to come on this grid and any um, expired accounts, you could easily just look up by filtering the grid. So that can be pretty helpful if there, you know, if there is a situation where, um, you know, maybe some accounts have been expired. But, um, but that's it. So I know we booked it through like a lot of information today. So I hope that wasn't like too overwhelming. Um, but I think that um, all of those pieces are, um, you know, pre pretty interesting. Uh, tomorrow we have, let's see, reports, utilities, and some miscellaneous items that we're going to talk about. So um, that's where we're at, same time, same place. So it'll be 9 a.m. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything that we covered today? I just wanna make sure we open um, this up one more time. Okay, all right, well, um, thank you all for coming to day two of the overview training. Um, yeah, if you think of any questions later, always uh, let us know. Feel free to put in tickets, but um, I hope you all have a wonderful day and uh, hopefully we will see you tomorrow.